Good evening. Good evening. I'm Fong Sheng Hu, Dean of Arts and Sciences. I'm delighted to be here with you today to celebrate the installation of Chancellor Emeritus Mark Wrighton as the James and Mary Watch Distinguished University Professor. Although I've been here as Dean of Arts and Sciences for over a year, this marks my first installation ceremony at Washington University. It's such a pleasure to be here today and to be a part of this wonderful community. I cannot think of a better occasion for which to gather in person. Thank you all for being here today. I also want to acknowledge the many viewers who are joining us today through the live stream, including Jim and Mary's family, their sons, Tyler and Nick, and their daughter-in-law, Jessica. To all of you, I extend my warmest welcome on behalf of Washiu and Arts and Sciences. As I was preparing these remarks this morning, I took the opportunity to reflect a bit on this past year. Even with the ongoing challenges of the pandemic, this has been an incredible year for our university and for arts and sciences. We have a lot of great news to share, and the most recent highlight is that Chancellor Martin announced that Washiu is making an unprecedented investment of $1 billion in financial aid to our students. This is such an inspirational and transformative initiative that we all should be enormously proud of. At WashU, the sky is the limit. We have no doubt that we have a bright future ahead of us, thanks to our visionary leaders and brilliant scholars, both past and present, taking bold initiatives and making groundbreaking contributions. Each event like this is unique and special, offering an occasion to honor the extraordinary colleagues who through their hard work and creativity have had a lasting impact on our university and on the world. However, this particular installation is extraordinarily special. Not only are we celebrating the distinguished career of a remarkable scientist, and our former Chancellor Mark Wrighton. But we are honoring Jim and Mary Watch, who have been outstanding members of our university community. So this is an occasion of double joy and double happiness. Chancellor Martin will comment on Mark's many contributions as an academic leader later in the program, but I want to quickly mention that as a fellow scientist, I have long admired Mark's brilliance. Many of you know that Mark won a, Nobel, uh, uh, a MacArthur Fellowship, not quite a Nobel Prize, <laughs> MacArthur Fellowship a few decades ago. And a MacArthur Fellowship is commonly known as a genius grant. Although I personally think that the word genius is overused, even in the context of MacArthur Fellows, it fits so well for Mark. Even back in the 1970s and 1980s, when he was active in research, Mark conducted similar work in the areas of inorganic photochemistry, photocatalysis, and the use of solar energy in photovoltaics. And one of his areas of research involved attempting to chemically mimic photosynthesis. Now, I'm not a chemist, but I do know that these topics remain hot and trendy decades later today, especially in the context of anthropogenic climate change. Indeed, Mark's career and accomplishments are a source of inspiration to me and to our entire university community. On a personal level, I have benefited from Mark's warmth and wisdom and our developing friendship has enriched my own Washu experience. And for that, I thank you very much, Mark. Mark is joined this evening by his wife, Risa Zwalling Wrighton, who has served the university and St. Louis communities in many ways over the years. 
She founded the Home Plate Program in which local families host students for home-cooked meals. She has also been a long-time supporter of student-led philanthropies such as Relay for Life and Dance Marathon. Mark and Luisa's children, JJ and Anna, and granddaughters, Estella and January, are also with us here today. May I ask Mark's family to please rise and be recognized. Thank you so much for being here today. The James and Mary Walsh Distinguished Professorship was established by Washington University to honor Jim and Mary for their decades-long contributions. This new professorship is an enduring tribute to them, and for Mark Wrighton, a longtime colleague of theirs, to be the inaugural holder of this professorship in their names is truly special. Jim and Mary came to Washu in 1995, the same year Mark took the helm as chancellor. Jim has held appointments in a number of units in arts and sciences, anthropology, education, psychology, and international and area studies now known as global studies. His fields of research include collective memory and identity, especially in Russia and other countries of the former Soviet Union, Jim has also held visiting faculty appointments around the world, and he and Mary have lived in many foreign countries. Jim is a fellow of the prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the author of over 200 publications in a dozen languages. His latest book was published earlier this year, and the book focuses on how national memory contributes to the negative tendencies of nationalism that give rise to confrontation, indeed a very timely topic today. This book concludes with a list of ways to manage the disputes that pit one community against another. Jim, we think globally and act locally. We do have similar issues in some of the departments between different groups. And I was just dealing with one today. So I'm hoping to pick your brain to tackle these issues. Mary is also an accomplished author, as well as an independent publisher and an expert on the subculture of individuals raised in Korea military families. She's the author of a book entitled Military Brett's Legacy of Childhood Inside a Fortress. In addition, Mary has served as a poetry writing instructor in St. Louis Public Elementary Schools as director of Missourians Against Handgun Violence and as director of Gateway to Science, and she's now a professional artist. Jim served as the inaugural director of the McDonald International Scholars Academy, which was founded in 2005 as a hub of international activities for WashU to shape the next generation of global leaders. This became a major focus of activity for both Jim and Mary. Under Jim's leadership, the academy grew in size and scope to include 34 partner institutions from all over the world, sharing expertise and research and working together to confront global challenges. So Mark, Jim, and Mary, we are so grateful for all you have done and continue to do for WashU and for our community. It's truly an honor and privilege to have this opportunity today to recognize you through the Walsh Distinguished Professorship. Congratulations and thank you so much again. Now I would like to invite Jim and Mary and Chancellor Martin to the podium. Please. I'll take it function. Thank you. Jim and Mary, I'd like to present to you this medallion 
as a symbol of our indebtedness for your family's generosity, leadership, and commitment to Washington University. The front reads, James and Mary Wirtz Distinguished University Professorship Arts and Sciences, and engraved on the plaque, in grateful appreciation, presented to James V. and Mary E. Wirtz, October 14th, 2021. Congratulations and thank you. And I would now like to invite Jim to make a few remarks. Well, it's a great privilege and honor to be here to get today <clears throat> to celebrate a lot of the university's accomplishments and especially the inauguration of Mark Wrighton as the holder of the, the first holder of a chair that, believe it or not, has our name on it. So <laughs> we're really delighted to be here. Mary and I have loved Wash U, and especially our time at the Academy has been a high point for us. I think um, when we started talking about the Academy back in 2004, 2005, Mark Wrighton and John McDonnell <clears throat> talked to me about this. And one of the things I learned right away is that Mark had a very sophisticated vision one that it took me years to understand exactly what the, all the parts of it were and how they worked together. And every time I thought, you know, that's not gonna work, Mark, this is uh, not the right way to go, I've been proven wrong. Um, so in developing this idea, <clears throat> we have a few basic missions for the McDonald Academy. Uh, first of all, we wanted to help recruit the best and the brightest students from around the world to do graduate and professional degrees here at Washington University. Um, Academy provides full support for stipend and partial tuition for all these scholars, 92 of whom are now in residence, and 164 have graduated, or alums, or what we call scholars for life in the McDonald Academy. And Kurt Dirks continues this work as the director of the Academy. A second vision, or second part of the mission we had was to provide not just a great place to do your work in a laboratory or in the field or in the library, but to be a great place to think about how you're going to develop leadership for problems in the future. We need to find future global leaders and help them develop because we have a lot of problems in the future right now, actually. <laughs> so um, this is a great part of what we did. We had seminars on this. We took cohort trips to Washington, D.C., uh, New York to see people in the media, think tanks, uh, Congress, the Senate. A lot of different things that brought the scholars together to see leadership in action by others, but also to spend time together to bond. And um, we also asked all the scholars, actually required all the scholars, to give at least one presentation of their own in what series we call the Global Leadership Vision presentations. It's really scary for a lot of scholars, but let me tell you, these folks are so smart, it doesn't take them very long to figure out how to do a really great job at this kind of thing, to present on some topic that has to do with their own Research, maybe, but also a world problem. And the third mission that I'd like to talk about is what could be called purposeful pluralism. This is a great term that I just discovered that uh, I see Beverly nodding. I think she knows this term. Uh, uh, comes from John Hopkins president, Ronald Daniels, that dis nicely describes part of our effort that we've been pursuing for the past 15 years. Um, we oftentimes talk about it to, in turn to the scholars and, and recruiting them to say, look, we want you to come here to be a great academic researcher, to be a great professor, teacher, whatever you want to do in the future in the corporate world. But we also insist that you meet ideas and people you maybe ne would never meet otherwise, including some that you might not like, as a matter of fact, at least initially. But that's part of what it takes to be able to deal with issues and ideas that maybe you have never even heard of but you're gonna deal with one way or the other in the future, and we wanna help you equip you to do that. Goes, so this goes way beyond recruiting a diverse student body, which we've done a wonderful job at, at Washington University for some time, but it goes beyond recruiting. You can't just put people together and shake them up and hope the mix works. Um, we've tried to do things beyond that, and we're one of the efforts at Washington University. We're not the only one, but we've been very active in this regard involving an active effort while you try to encourage this without 
while also trying to avoid any attempt to indoctrinate or to assimilate to a single view of the scholars we have in the academy. This in starts with encouraging pluralism. It's, after all, purposeful pluralism we're talking about here. It starts in simple ways. For example, by celebrating different societies' dress, food, and culture, which you do in the activity in the McDonald Academy. Mary's here to demonstrate a little bit tonight <laughs> by wearing a costume that comes from two African countries put together. So this is a kind of tradition we've developed in the academy. But we also said, look, we've got to go beyond superficial friendly discussions. We don't want to <laughs> encourage conflict, but we do want you to deal with things that are not so easy to go beyond talking about restaurants or shows in St. Louis or what you did here or there. We want you to think of a little bit more deeply about bigger challenges. And so just as one example of that in McDonald Academy Global Leadership Vision presentations, on one occasion, we um, organized a joint presentation by a, a scholar from Hong Kong and another scholar from uh, China, mainland China. Now this is, uh, this uh, relationship between PRC and Hong Kong didn't end up where we thought it would 10 years ago, to be sure. But on the other hand, we had a trial run and having some kind of serious discussion, engage, purposeful, considerate, and thoughtful in doing this. So th we hope this is a way to think of our expanded and long-term mission at Washington University in general. And to the extent we've succeeded in the, in the McDonald Academy in, and in providing a model for this, it reflects Mark's vision, commitment, and hard work since 2005. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I am so pleased uh, to be here to celebrate Jim and Mary Wirch and also Mark Wrighton. As I'm sure you know, Mark preceded me as chancellor, so today's program is a rare opportunity for me to get to go before him. With this installation, we are recognizing three outstanding citizens of Washington University and of our world. A profound aspect of Mark's legacy here at WashU is the achievement of his vision to make Washington University a global leader. Because of Mark, we enjoy strong and fruitful relationships with elite institutions worldwide, and we welcome students from approximately 100 countries each year. The McDonnell International Scholars Academy was born from this vision, and today is a premier global education and research program. Of course, Mark's accomplishments extend far beyond the McDonnell Academy. He's a distinguished chemist with more than 300 articles and 16 patents to his name. He began his academic career at MIT, where he served as professor, chemistry department chair, and provost. And he was recruited to WashU to become our 14th chancellor in 1995. When he stepped down from the position in 2019, he was the second longest serving chancellor in Washington University history. Under Mark's leadership, our university grew by leaps and bounds in some of the most important ways. Washington University became more academically competitive and Mark signed 85,000 diplomas, including mine, launching a generation of world changers. Enrollment rose by 33%, and the number of annual undergraduate applications increased threefold. And we became a more diverse campus, welcoming more Pell-eligible students than ever before, broadening our perspective, and deepening our impact. The faculty grew by more than 50%, with the addition of more than 1,000 scholars, researchers, and clinicians. These include four Nobel Prize winners. Early in his tenure, he worked toward the development of the Siteman Cancer Center and the McDonald Genome Institute, paving the way for discovery of new treatments and compassionate patient care for our most precious resources. Mark encouraged and supportive innovative and cross-disciplinary research, and federal research grants increased by more than $310 million per year. Mark is a champion for environmentally responsible growth, and the 35 buildings, totaling more than 3 million square feet, were added to this Danforth campus, doubling the campus's size with no increase in energy use. 
Mark was clear-minded about his vision and gifted at bringing others on board. Under his care, the university's endowment increased from $1.96 billion to more than $8 billion, ensuring our mission to impact lives in service of the greater good is something we can count on for generations to come. Mark's visionary leadership launched a new era of excellence and achievement for Washington University. He guided us with a steadfast resolve and capacity to inspire others. His wide stewardship strengthened our ability to teach students, advance knowledge, heal patients, and serve the greater good. Mark's acumen as a leader in higher education is widely recognized, and he has recently been asked to serve as interim president of George Washington University in Washington, D.C. for 18 months beginning in January while the search for a permanent president takes place. I could not think of a better person for the job, although Mark's gonna to have to keep remembering to say George a lot and not so much St. Louis. <laughs> uh, there is so much more I could say about Mark and his accomplishments, but I wanna make sure we have enough time to hear from the man himself. You can read more about Mark and his family in your program. Mark, we are so grateful for all that you and Risa have done to make WashU one of the world's leading centers of learning and discovery. And while you'll be greatly missed during your upcoming sabbatical at George Washington University, we look forward to your return to St. Louis and to campus when it is done. So let's welcome Mark to the podium with a round of applause. So Mark, I didn't ask you how many times you've been able to do this, uh, many I know. It is now my pleasure to present this medallion to, to you on behalf of all of our colleagues. Professor Mark S. Wrighton, I present you this medallion as a symbol of your appointment. The front reads, James and Mary Wirch Distinguished University Professorship in Arts and Sciences. And on the rear, Mark S. Wrighton, October 14th, 2021. Congratulations. Thank you. Very Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was very generous, overly so, I might note, but much appreciated. Andrew, I wish you continued and great success in your chancellorship. 15 is a good number. I also want to thank Jim and Mary for their tremendous contributions to my success as chancellor. Uh, Jim and I have logged uh, tens of thousands of miles and many hours on the road. He is a great traveling companion and we've had many very favorable experiences together representing Washington University all around the world. Here in St. Louis, though Mary sometimes came along on the international excursions, uh, Jim and Mary were great partners in advancing the mission of the McDonald International Scholars Academy. They were essential uh, to fulfilling our aspirations to welcome really talented people from all around the world and also for them to thrive. And Jim and Mary reached out to them personally on many occasions to support them well beyond, well beyond the academic experiences that they had. So Jim and Mary, thank you very much. I'd also like to thank Risa, who has been my steadfast partner. Most of you know our story. Uh, about two weeks after I arrived in St. Louis, we met for lunch, and um, I asked her prior to that lunch, uh, you know, what is your interest in the university? This is in a telephone call. And she said, I have none. <laughs> I just want to meet you. And so I said, splendid. <laughs> and 
we met for lunch and we have been together ever since. I also uh, note that um, over the summer of 1995, the summer that Jim and Mary and I all arrived essentially contemporaneously, uh, Risa and I started uh, interacting and by the time the first academic events began to take place, the social elements of uh, this university, Risa was at, at my side. And though we have a great uh, team here at the university, looking out for all the things that go on at special events, I would go early and I would move the name cards around so that Risa would be seated next to me. <laughs> and um, it was a great experience for us to begin to work together uh, to build the quality and impact of the university. So I'm very grateful, Risa, for all of your contributions. And I'm really pleased that my son JJ and his two daughters, Estella and January, could be here. They were in this very space um, back in late May of 2019. Craig Schnook was pre presiding and Barbara Shaw was participating and we were dedicating this new facility. But it was a little bit ironic that this building was named uh, in my honor. Of course, I'm a chemist, but I haven't done any for uh, 25 or 26 years. But um, it was a real honor uh, to be here to celebrate this dedication. And I'm grateful that my family were able to be here Indeed, family members who are now watching online uh, were here, and uh, it was a great uh, pleasure to have everyone there. My daughter Rebecca in San Diego, our daughter Anna and her husband Josh uh, in Washington, D.C. are there, and I expect uh, the little girls, the little granddaughters, are probably buzzing around uh, disrupting the wine fest that my daughter and son-in-law are probably having. <laughs> to all of those who are online, feel free to continue sipping wine, but uh, I would like you to take a look at some of the slides that I have. Uh, I'm going to give an overview of uh, issues related to research and education that would be helpful in addressing the global challenges that we face. And I'd like to begin by just summarizing from my perspective the mission of a university. Our aim is to, education, to educate for life and career and prepare society's leaders. This is not just the McDonald International Scholars Academy. This is our overall mission. At the same time, this is a research university where we strive to create new knowledge that's going to benefit humankind. We are also a cultural center for music, performing arts, and literature. And we have many talented individuals making important contributions in these areas. And broadly construed, our mission is to serve society, to provide service. And at a university like Washington University that is fortunate to have one of the premier schools of medicine, we just need to go to the school of medicine. And day in, day out, people's lives are being saved. Diseases are being overcome. And this is a great example of what America has been able to do with its research university enterprise. What I wanted to do in this presentation is give you a sense of some of the things that I'm most proud of in terms of developments since I started back in 1995, and then address 
some of the global challenges that we face as a global community. And I'm very proud that we have many people here at Washington University, talented, dedicated people who are making a difference in solving these problems. To me, the key to making a major impact is the combination of resources and leadership. This can lead to success. And resources, of course, include the financial resources. But it's really the talent pool that we can draw on. We have a great many very talented students who want to make important contributions. And one of the things that I've encouraged is that undergraduates, as soon as they are interested, that they should become involved in original scholarship. For me, looking back on my own experiences at Florida State University, I feel that one of the most transformative contributions to my life was a faculty member, Jack Saul Teal, who took me into his research group and he really taught me about science. Science is, in fact, very interesting. I'm not going to mention much chemistry today. You'll be grateful for that, I expect. But uh, with Jack Saltiel, I was able to actually do science, not just learn about it. And so it was a great experience. So human resources are incredibly important. And then, of course, we have to have the infrastructure, the framework within which we can make these contributions. And in terms of leadership, uh, I have been very fortunate to work with a great team at Washington University. And in my comments, as this presentation unfolds, I want to underscore the contributions of several people, people who have led with great dedication, but with integrity and great creativity and tremendous sensitivity. We have, uh, over the course of the last 25 years, and in part, uh, Andrew noted, we've been very successful in strengthening our undergraduate student body. We've enhanced quality. We've built diversity. And affordability has been tended to. Affordability for the students and their families, and affordable for Washington University. The key leaders in these areas early on in my tenure were John Berg and the late Jim McLeod. And they assembled a tremendous team of individuals working to build the student body and to provide for them the very best student experience. I'm proud that we have been focused on the student experience. And John and Jim were tremendous contributors to this effort. Today, Rona Turner is taking over, setting records in building the applicant pool in every dimension, in numbers, in diversity, and in quality. I'm really pleased to see the continuing progress. And of course, uh, I'm really excited that the dean noted that we have significant resources now uh, to extend to financial aid. I'm really proud that the trustees were very active. Uh, those trustees associated with the Washington University Investment Management Company, tending to the uh, important responsibility that they carry to oversee the endowment, and they recruited Scott Wilson. He is our Michael Bloomberg in connection with our ability to go need blind. And it's really great to see that these tremendous resources come to Washington University. We've been able to build a strong faculty, an expanded faculty, as you heard from Andrew. Endowed professorships like this one 
honor individuals, and I certainly feel very well honored, and I appreciate very much the recognition and the support that goes to our faculty through the endowments that have been created is tremendous. This enables us to attract, and uh, when we have those retention battles, uh, the retention is far more successful when we have these resources. Thanks to David Blassengame and his team, more than 300 new endowed professorships have been created in the last 25 years, and this is a tremendous, tremendous contribution to the ultimate well-being of the university, as the faculty really are the key partners in developing this institution in every respect. David is uh, here today, and I'd like to thank him publicly for his great contributions. Thank you. <laughs> Students and faculty, that's what it's all about. And uh, at the same time, we have to work to undertake initiatives that are going to make a huge difference in what we provide to society. And one of the combinations of leadership and resources is manifest in the, in the Alvin J. Seitman Cancer Center. Tim Eberlein is the leader and he has been so since Bill Peck, former dean of the School of Medicine, asked him to lead a planning effort which ultimately become, became a so-called comprehensive cancer center designated by the National Cancer Institute. Today, the Seitman Cancer Center is one of the premier programs of its kind in the world, third largest in terms of new cancer patients in America, third after MD Anderson and Sloan Kettering in New York. A tremendous achievement, and I feel very fortunate that this took place during my chancellorship. As I've joked often, I'm a doctor, but not the kind that can help you. I'm in fact an inorganic chemist, but it was great to work with Tim in uh, developing the resources that ultimately proved essential in building the Seitman Cancer Center. And of course, I'm really grateful that we had the visionary leadership of John McDonnell. He was very active uh, with our efforts to explore opportunities internationally. Soon after my arrival, I picked up uh, a committee report. You know, that's what universities do. Whenever there's an issue, they report, they have a committee. And uh, I looked at this committee report and it said, uh, we should strive to do things in Asia. And we formed the International Advisory Council for Asia. John McDonnell participated in every one of our meetings, starting in Taipei, and uh, after about 15 meetings, we ended up in Seoul, Korea in June of 2004. And at that time, we conceived what became the McDonnell International Scholars Academy. John has been uh, a tremendous supporter and a key contributor uh, to our success in this undertaking. He remains very active He's on the advisory committee, and during our most recent campaign, made a magnificent endowment commitment to enable us to enhance the program. The McDonald Scholars do have a great experience, and one of the experiences that the scholars have is the opportunity to travel to both Washington, D.C. and New York City these iconic photographs, especially the one on the right, uh, is the opportunity that we had as a McDonnell, McDonnell Academy group, a cohort, uh, to ring the opening bell uh, at the New York Stock Exchange. 
Uh, it was a, a slow time in terms of IPOs and the like, so somehow we managed to weasel in and uh, be able to do that. I'm told that something like 60 million people actually see an image like this on a given day. So it lifted the visibility of Washington University all around the country and to a degree around the world. In spring of 2022, I've already offered to Kurt Dirks that I would be willing to host the McDonald Scholars at the President's residence uh, at the George Washington University. <laughs> and uh, we'll be doing that. And the President's residence in DC is only four blocks from the White House. So I expect uh, I'll be having coffee from time to time with the real president. <laughs> the McDonald Academy has had uh, great leaders, and Jim and Mary are being celebrated. I've mentioned John McDonald, but I also want to mention David Connor. David Connor has been a longtime supporter of our international efforts. Uh, and he has served as the chair of our International Advisory Committee and has been a proponent of what we have been doing. Uh, David, thank you for being here. It's great to see you. Thank you for your leadership. And Jim has already mentioned Kurt Dirks, who continues as director of the McDonald International Scholars Academy. Thank you, Kurt, for the continuing excellent leadership uh, Kurt, uh, just e last evening, convened the first year scholars, and I had a session with them that lasted about an hour and a half last night, and we've recruited a tremendous group of people, very inquisitive, very uh, engaging, and I know that uh, they will emerge as global leaders. We also have distinguished members of the faculty serving as ambassadors to our partners. And this has been a very rewarding part of the academy. These faculty ambassadors are building what we call academic commerce between Washington University and our partners in other countries. Our alumni, and Jim mentioned a number of over 160 now. And uh, I'm especially proud that McDonnell Academy scholars who are out and about emerging as global leaders are now on the faculty of some of our partner institutions. And that's a long-term goal, that these faculty will emerge themselves as leaders alumni of the McDonnell Scholar Program, and also engaged in advancing their own institution. That will cement and enhance our collaborations. And lest I leave it out, uh, oh, there are a few buildings that were developed, and a few things happened during my chancellorship. Uh, this is an especially beautiful image of the East End redevelopment. I'd like to thank Craig Schnook for his leadership, Andy Newman, uh, for his leadership. And uh, it's been really fun to see this project come to a conclusion. I think much more uh, is to be done as the trees uh, need to mature. But uh, I think they're coming along. And I would like to uh, understand from Mike Ferguson, the landscape architect that we engage, how he thinks we're doing in terms of that development. But a lot of academic facilities, residential spaces, and important places like the Danforth University Center have been developed. Let me now turn to these global challenges. There are a number. And of course, uh, we have a stake uh, in addressing each of them. Aging of the global population is one that concerns me. I'm now very chronologically mature. I hope that I will uh, continue to be maturing. And uh, this is a very important challenge for the entire world. 
that there are going to be economic and social consequences of the aging population. Of course, climate change, energy, environment, and sustainability, certainly in the air. Just recently, uh, there has been documentation of the extraordinary increase in the number of weather disasters that each cost more than $1 billion. The frequency of these events seems to be accelerating. And of course, we're in the midst of a pandemic. I never thought I would see an auditorium filled with people with masks on because of the problem that we face with an infectious disease. Another challenge, diminished biodiversity. And while the population is aging in many countries, the population is also growing globally. And this means we need more food and water for that growing global population. To me, no single institution, indeed no country, no matter how strong and large they are, will be able to address all of these problems by themselves. Collaboration is not just a positive quality. It's essential to deal with these problems. And as a scientist, I'm very pleased that I see the opportunity to contribute to advance, for example, energy technologies. I'm really pleased to be talking with undergraduates who are in my class teaching, uh, I'm teaching chemistry and energy. But I know full well that if a scientist or an engineer is involved in a new development, one that would have global consequence, that many other people are going to have to be involved in solving the ultimate problems. Social scientists and, hum and people in the humanities and I wouldn't have thought about it uh, until these days, but this is also a political issue. Uh, legislatures have sometimes thought about uh, redoing the laws of thermodynamics. But I think most of people have agreed that the laws of thermodynamics are not going to be changed by a legislature. But what we see going on today with COVID-19 is really troubling uh, as a person educated and uh, a participant uh, in science. So global challenges are going to require many people, many different backgrounds, and let's take a look at aging, for example. Many people are growing older in many countries but the changes depend on where you live. Uh, here is a graph that shows by different parts of the world and the entire world, the population in percentages of people age 65. Sorry, uh, 65, I guess, is defined as elderly. I don't feel elderly, but that's the definition. The fraction of elderly is uh, very significant in the developed world, but Africa is actually quite small, three or four percent. So this is a region by region issue, but some of the most well-developed countries like South Korea and Japan face a combination of very low population growth and a significant aging of their population. That combination may be more difficult, Andrew, than the combination of no mandatory tenure, no mandatory retirement and tenure. So, so this is a uh, a graphical representation of the distribution of ages uh, for three different countries. Ghana, which houses, which is home to one of our McDonnell Academy partners, the University of Ghana, 
you see as a very different age distribution than either China or Japan. We're more like Japan as a country. We're aging also. But when you think about Africa, I was really impressed when I saw this kind of image that Africa is so large in terms of its geography that it is a land area that is greater than India, China, the 48 uh, states of the United States, Western and Eastern Europe combined. And as we look to the future, uh, there are going to be many more people on Earth, and many of them are going to be in Africa. So this is an area where we should be doing more. When we think about our programs here, I'm really grateful that uh, we have Professor Nancy Morrill Howell of the Brown School as the director of the Friedman Center for Aging, and she is doing a terrific job. I saw Nancy earlier, and I'd like to acknowledge her leadership here at Washington University in this area. Energy is the area that uh, I've done a lot of work on earlier in my life. One of my claims to frame, fame is uh, that I was able to convert light to useful chemical energy with a higher efficiency than any other uh, researcher. But unfortunately, the light was ultraviolet light and the sun's spectral distribution only contains about 5% ultraviolet. Thus, though I have the record in terms of converting ultraviolet light to hydrogen from water, there is an overall very low efficiency. We have the aspiration to have abundant energy at an affordable cost. We want to minimize the adversity on the environment and we want to achieve energy security, locally, nationally, and globally. And one of the things that has come up in the news recently, I've been talking with my class about it, is the challenge with natural gas. Natural gas leaks produce methane as a serious greenhouse gas. Locally, we're threatened with a constrained supply of natural gas because uh, political leaders apparently cannot agree that the gas should be supplied with a given pipeline. But we need to address these problems. And I raise to you a question that I pose to my students. Is solar energy the ultimate answer or is it nuclear? Most people would not vote for nuclear, but it's going to be very hard to achieve our objectives quickly with solar. I would like to advocate for nuclear now, solar later. As costs come down, and importantly, as storage becomes viable for electrical energy, then solar will become very, very important. Here at Washington University, we've had great leaders uh, in terms of issues related to energy, environment, and sustainability. First to Madri Pakrasi, and now David Fike leaving this important international center. And this is not just a global problem. Um, I was fortunate to be able to sign this declaration with former uh, Mayor Lyda Krusen, and in the background in this image is one of the leaders of Ameren, Michael Main, who is in fact an alumnus of Washington University. And we're signing a document that says St. Louis will participate in lowering our carbon dioxide emissions. And this ent entire effort, we're still in, was funded by Michael Bloomberg. 
I'd like to conclude with something that is relatively new here at Washington University, namely the challenge of sustaining biodiversity. And you see an image of a living creature on the upper right, which in some way demonstrates the diversity that you find in nature. Look at the colors. That is real photograph. And there is tremendous impact, positive impact, that comes from the richness in biodiversity. And I am so grateful that we were able to recruit Jonathan Lasso's to come to Washington University. He had been here, made an important mark, was recruited away to Harvard, and we recruited him back. I'd like to thank Barbara Shaw for doing that. I know she's here, and I'd like to thank you, Barbara, for a tremendous <laughs> contribution. This Living Earth Collaborative is a one-of-a-kind kind of endeavor, a great research university partnered with the St. Louis Zoo, one of the important institutions of its kind, and with the Bot Botanical Garden. This is a tremendous opportunity for Washington University and these great St. Louis institutions to have a positive impact on the world. Through the leaders here, through the resources that we can apply, financial, human, and infrastructural, I know that we can solve these global challenges. And I look forward to following the progress and to a degree as a professor just participating in the great programs of this university. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark, for those words of wisdom and, and insightful comments on a wide range of topics. And congratulations again. We are so fortunate that you chose WashU as your academic home, and we are extremely grateful for your visionary leadership and outstanding contributions. And thank you all so much for taking part in this celebration. If you're here in person, I hope you will, you will stay for the reception and take this opportunity to congratulate the writings and the watches. This concludes the formal portion of today's ceremony. Have a great evening. <laughs>